What's up, gangsters? It is a fine, sunny, but super cold winter day out here at Rube Goldberg Enterprises. And I think I'm going to do a video uh, that's actually been requested. Um, that does happen from time to time, uh, uh, at least when it coincides with something that I've thought about doing anyway. And this is a good topic, I think. Polishing canopies. Uh, it seems to come up frequently, um, and it came up the other day in Scale Modeler's Critique Group. And it's something that, um, if you're going to do aircraft modeling, it's going to happen from time to time. Um, whether because uh, the canopy in question has a, a seam line molded into it, um, which is pretty common with bubble top canopies, particularly modern jets. Um, or, you know, if the canopy just has molding irregularities in it, or maybe you somehow uh, accidentally scratch it or whatever. Um, now, be before I get started on that, though, um, this topic also comes up a lot when people bring up the subject of dipping their canopies in a clear gloss varnish, <laughs> most commonly future. Uh, now, look, I'm not going to make any secret of the fact that I think this is a dumb thing to do, period. Period. <laughs> This is so ridiculous. I catch myself doing that all the time. Like when I'm leaving voicemails for people, I announce my punctuations. <laughs> and I do it because I'm always dictating to my phone. Like when I'm answering text messages or commenting on Facebook or whatever. And you have to tell it that you want a period or an exclamation mark. And it just has become ingrained in my brain that sometimes I find myself actually... Uh, including it in... Uh, anyway, <laughs> okay, that's embarrassing. Anyway, um, so yeah, I think dipping canopies in clear gloss varnish is just a dumb thing to do. And here's why. Uh, first of all, that's not going to fix something like a molded-in seam line. No amount of, of, of clear uh, varnish is going to take care of that, so you kind of don't have any choice but to polish it. If your only goal is to make the thing look more clear. Yeah, sometimes uh, dipping it in a clear gloss varnish will help your cause. I admit that. But the problem is that it comes at the expense of a predictable future when it comes to the future. <laughs> See what I did there? It comes at the expense of a predictable path when it comes to weathering and painting because anytime you introduce one substance, you increase the risk of having a bad reaction with substances that go on top of that later. And when you get to that point where it really matters with a canopy, the penalty is high because you've masked and you've you know carefully laid everything out and you've got the canopy frame you know perfectly painted and you peel your masking off and you start doing some weathering and bam, something happens to the future or the whatever clear varnish you've used that can only be fixed by stripping it all off. And if you've done it properly, your canopy is already glued to the model. It is, right? <laughs> and now you've got a disaster on your hands. So was all that really worth getting a debatable improvement in clarity? Especially when you consider that maybe they weren't all that super clear in the first place. I don't know. I just think that it's an unnecessary risk for a very questionable reward. So, I think it's a dumb thing to do. So, that's enough of that. Let's get into what happens or what needs to happen if you agree and you um, are actually ready to polish a canopy. It's a subject that seems to terrify a lot of model makers, but as I think you'll see, it's really not that hard. Let's take a look. Okay, here we go. Now, I wanted to make this one of my 10 minutes of technique videos, and if I can do some clever editing and make that work out, then I will, but probably not going to happen, especially given the challenge that I've set for myself. <laughs> yeah. I, this is the only canopy that was rolling around in my spares box that has that seam in the middle. This is a uh, canopy from the Tamiya 
132nd Mustang kit, and they give you several of them for, you know, there's different shapes. And I use this one, obviously, as a mask. And it is at least partially covered with uh, blue metallic urethane paint and a at least partially uh, continuous layer of 2K clear urethane gloss. And uh, yeah, that stuff is tough uh, under any circumstances, but this is like four years old. It's also got gunk on the inside of it, uh, you know, some blue tack from sticking it down. I mean, this thing is a mess. And honestly, I don't know if I can get all of this off of here, but the first thing that I'm gonna try, which is also sort of uh, a little bit of a proof of something else that I've uh, said, which is that if you get a little bit of a paint goober on a canopy, and this is especially true if it's uh, like if you're using MRP, or anything that you've reduced with Mr. Leveling Thinner. And that is that you can use a mild lacquer thinner that I just spilled everywhere. I forgot how full that bottle was. Wow, this is just turning into a live camera disaster. Hold on, paper towel. And lots of fumes now, so I'm gonna be high as fuck by the time I get into this. Um, Anyway, a mild lacquer thinner. And you can see just how mild this stuff is because here I am wiping all of it off of my workbench and it's not removing the grid lines. And I can promise you from past experience that regular lacquer thinner, just straight hardware store stuff, will destroy the little blue lines on my grid instantly. There's a little bit of pure lacquer thinner, hardware store stuff, and see that? See how it just ate through the panel, the panel line. <laughs> um, this, this video is going to be a comedy of errors, but you see how I just was able to erase a little bit of that blue line right there? That's the difference between a regular hardware store lacquer thinner and a mild lacquer thinner. Um, this Tamiya lacquer thinner is one of those, um, as is uh, Mr. Leveling thinner, the new uh, 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 the new retarded Tamiya lacquer thinner. And, I, and when I say retarded, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not being mean because you know you can't say that word anymore. Uh, it is retarded because it has a retarding agent in it. It's basically a slow lacquer thinner just like Mr. Leveling Thinner is, um, which gives it more time to uh, cure the paint, gives, gives it more time to cure and level out, hence the name Mr. Leveling Thinner. But look, it is starting to get some of this stuff off of here. And there are several layers here. There's black primer on it, there's a silver base coat, then there's the blue, and then there's the um, 2K clear urethane. But I don't know that I'm going to get through all of that, and I'm not going to sit here on video for 10 minutes or however long it's going to take working on this uh, and making you guys watch. So. I'm gonna see what I can do, and one way or the other, I mean, I may end up just soaking this thing in brake fluid for a while, but one way or the other, when I come back, I will have a canopy that uh, we can try to polish. Okay, so I went and sprayed some Easy Off on it because that's what I had handy, and Easy Off is pretty stout. Um, the active ingredient in Easy Off is Sodium hydroxide, also known as lye or caustic soda. It's what gangsters use to dissolve bodies, which is also why I have these little finger protectors on. It's good for stripping chrome, works pretty fast. Some people say it works for paint. I had some, didn't have any brake fluid in, in, uh, on hand. But I've let it sit there for about as long as it took me to go and use my Proxon with a little tiny dental burr 
that it may or may not focus on. Isn't that cool? Get that free from my dentist. And grind a an oval hole in the back of this thing that I'm working on and add an antenna from an old Airfix Spitfire kit. This is a futuristic robot kind of thing. That translated to about 15 minutes and here we have it. And um, I, I'm just showing you this because I, you know, testing on camera and all that. I don't know if Easy Off is going to do the job. The uh, Mild Lacquer Thinner was not doing it. Um, and the point that I was trying to make before I got distracted by spilling it all over my workbench is that when you're using a mild lacquer thinner it will not generally harm clear plastic as long as you're quick and gentle about it. If you scrub a lot, yeah, you can turn the clear plastic cloudy with it. Um, and I'll show you that um, once we get all this other gunk off of here. But in general, the point I was trying to make is that a mild lacquer thinner is a good correction fluid for paint mistakes on clear plastic, which seems counterintuitive because regular lacquer thinner obviously should never come anywhere near styrene of any kind, really, but definitely not clear plastic. So anyway, I'm going to continue working with this and see what it takes to get this off of here. and We'll come back later. Okay, so it's about uh, five o'clock in the evening and Operation Strip the paint from the canopy uh, has been going on off and on all afternoon and as you can see I have all of the paint off uh, and let me tell you kind of how that went the uh, uh, oven cleaner did basically nothing to the 2k clear urethane uh, so you can take comfort in knowing that if you ever crash your car into a tanker truck full of easy off that while your body will be completely dissolved, your paint will be fine. <laughs> I don't know how that works, but hey, uh, it is what it is. Um, at any rate, uh, since that didn't work, and I let it sit in there for like an hour, um, I washed that off and then just threw it into some isopropyl alcohol. Um, and lo and behold, within about an hour, the stuff started flaking off, and uh, I just... You know, let it sit in there and I'd scrub it a little bit and as soon as some more of it wrinkled up I'd kind of turn the thing around and let it soak some more and then and then get the you know scrub the rest of it off and um, so there you go the material uh, the uh, uh, the chemical that is very clearly uh, gonna dissolve your skin doesn't work at all but the material that is made for rubbing on your skin <laughs> takes the uh, stuff right off. So again, I don't know how that works, but hey, chemistry is weird sometimes. At any rate, you can see that while the paint is gone, it is definitely not a nice clear canopy. And so this will be a, a really good polishing challenge. Uh, and I will tackle that tomorrow when uh, the sun is out and I'm feeling fresh. Okay, so here we go. It's the next morning and <laughs> this little canopy is pretty forlorn looking, but at least all of the paint is off. Um, but as you can see, we still have some staining and that's an effect from using lacquers and that's, that's a good demonstration of what lacquers do. They kind of etch themselves into the uh, surface of the styrene, uh, you know, so you get a better bond than you do with something that's just an acrylic, which basically just lays a skin over it. So, uh, at any rate, all the paint is off of there. <laughs> Here's what I think is kind of funny, though, is after all of that gyrating and uh, dipping and stripping and so forth, what's left? This chunk of blue tack. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that stuff is like a cockroach. It could survive a nuclear war. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and dig that off of there with my thumbnail and um, uh, then we'll get to the 
polishing attempt. And, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to bet any money yet on how successful that's going to be. Um, but, you know, it won't be a total waste of time because if nothing else, we've learned a little bit about uh, an extreme stripping situation. And I'm not talking about something that would happen at Spearmint Rhino in Dallas. <laughs> this was... Uh, Really, I was I was honestly kind of curious what it would take to get that, uh, get those three layers of paint plus 2K clear urethane off of there. Uh, but the first thing I'm going to do is remove this nub that's there for an antenna wire, I think, and then we'll go after that seam line. Now the reason that seam line is there, I don't. I think I sort of started to explain that before and then got sidetracked. Um, but that's because this thing has to be uh, slide molded or molded with lifters. Because see, it's got the shape of it, and this is common with a lot of these bubble canopies. The shape of it, see how it bulges out on the sides? That creates an undercut for the mold opening up and down this way. So the only solution for that is that these two part, that the sides of the mold right here on the left and the right have to move sideways for the tool to open. And that means that there's going to be a split in the mold right there and that's what creates that parting line witness. And the first thing I'm going to do to get rid of that, and I'm going to try and stay on camera. You guys know I suck at this, but I'll do my best. Anyway, the first thing I'm going to do to get rid of that is just adds it off of there with uh, this exacto number 10 blade that I love for this sort of thing and it doesn't take much because that's not a very that's not a very proud little ridge um, so you know don't go crazy with this part don't create any more work for yourself than necessary. I do this kind of thing with my Optivisor on and it lets me see pretty directly how my progress is going. And these paint stains are actually helping me because they act as kind of a little telltale um, that indicates perfectly when I've removed the ridge and you can use a sharpie to do that same thing just a black sharpie just color over it and when it's all gone you know that your ridge is also gone I also recommend working in strong side light because it will give you microscopic shadows that also help. Now this place where I got rid of that nub is going to be a little stubborn and since I'm not interested in wasting any time I will get out another one of my favorite tools which is a super sharp little uh, file and I'll take care of that. And I could use a file for this entire process, but I find that the adzing action of just the blade is really all that's necessary. And um, that gets that done. Okay, but the key thing there is to just do it do it slowly and, and, and in a controlled way and don't uh, you know, don't overdo it because you also don't want to create a flat spot that uh, will show up later. Okay, so there we go. That has the ridge removed, I believe, and you can see that there. Uh, that's all it took. 
So now, under normal circumstances, um, some guys would put a, a strip of masking tape along each side of that, maybe allow in a quarter of an inch of open space or something, but that prevents you from sanding the parts of the canopy that don't need it. <laughs> but that obviously doesn't apply in this case because the entire thing needs to be sanded. And um, so, uh, you know, and especially here where, I, where I've got this, this color etched into it because... Um, we're going to need to remove a little bit of material on the surface, I think, to get rid of that. So, uh, I'm going to start at 1500 grit. Um, I don't want to go really heavy, but I'm using these uh, sanding sponges from Infini. And uh, I like these really well. They have a real high quality abrasive on them. Uh, they clean out really nicely. Um, and... Uh, the uh, uh, they just they just do a good job. Now, one question is, sand wet or dry? I, you know, for this kind of thing, I mean, wet sanding is good um, because it uh, helps keep the uh, uh, the the grit cleaned out of uh, of the material or of the abrasive, and it and it sands a little bit better. But you don't have to. You know, especially if you uh, are only sanding a little bit, um, just keep your grit clean by wiping it on your sleeve occasionally. I'll go ahead and use some water for this first pass anyway. Um, it makes it a little harder to see what's going on when you use water because it just it just ten it tends to hide the small scratches. Um, I guess, hey, that's sort of the same principle as flooding it with a gloss coat. But anyway, um, I'm going to just do some sanding and not talking until I'm done. That way, if I decide I want to, I can turn this into fast motion video to uh, make it less long and boring. Uh, but one thing I will say is that this is also a point where some people will choose to stuff the inside of the canopy full of uh, something like Silly Putty. Especially on one that's really nice and thin like this, uh, so that it minimizes the risk of scratching. or uh, Sorry, scratching, of, of breaking it, cracking it is what I meant to say. It's not a requirement, but it's certainly one of those things that if it makes you feel more confident, then by all means, you should do it because you don't want to go through all this work only to break the thing in half and, you know, suffer all the pain from that. So at any rate, I'm just going to sand this out and um, I'm going to go from 1500 to 2500 um, and then uh, I have a 4000 grit Infini buffing stick and I predict that if this is going to work at all that by the time I get to the 4000 grit stick that it's going to be pretty well done um, but in looking at this now I may find that I have to back up a little bit to a coarser grit actually because I'm having a hard time getting that that blue stain to go away. I may have to, to take more material. I don't know. I'm just going to work on it. But at this point, it really is just elbow grease. And um, this first method that I'm going to do, I'm going to demonstrate without using any polishing compounds, um, but just using buffers. And you don't have to get these really nice infinity buff sanders and buffers you know you could use like just nail buffers from your local fingernail supply whatever um so, you know people do that with success i just happen to really like these sanders i think they do a great job i like that they have the grit labeled on them um and uh so anyway um, but but the first first way I'm going to demonstrate is just using these hand tools. Then I'm going to do it using 
a polishing compound that I like. Um, and you'll see the difference. Okay, so here we go. You have seen me go through this grit progression from 1500 through 4000. And uh, it's certainly looking much better. But obviously, it's not good enough. And this is, a, I think, a good place to point out that the secret to any polishing, whether it's a piece of clear plastic or regular plastic or a clear coat or whatever, is good sanding. And in my experience over practicing on this a lot, good sanding means a disciplined grit progression. And personally, and I felt like this before I started, uh, given the, how extreme this situation was, this is too much of a, of a jump. Um, and, and I'll show you what I mean. Going from 1500 to 2500 is enough of a jump. I would have preferred to have a 2000 in there. And certainly from 25 to 4,000, I would have preferred to have a 3,000 in there as well. But this is what I have. And for a so-called normal situation, I think it would have been fine. Because you can see that while it is still pretty cloudy, the seam line is definitely gone. And that's really what we were trying to demonstrate here. There's a little divot there from where I... Uh, cut a little too deep when I was taking that nub off, but the seam line is still there. But part of what's causing the cloudiness is, uh, and this is the bane of all sanding operations pre-polish, is that you get uh, scratch. If, if you make a, a grit progression or a grit jump that's too big, you get scratches left over from the previous round that are too deep for the current grit to remove and that's what creates that cloudiness and and you can see some of that um, right there there's you know it's not bad but there are still some scratches there left over from that 2500 grit um, and it is virtually impossible to remove those with a with with that finer grit that you're that you've jumped to the only thing you can really do is back up a grit so if i had a 3000 i would back up to the 3000 work that a little more to make sure that those deepest scratches were gone and then jump back up again but this is also a good point to demonstrate because some of this is also coming from cloudiness on the inside just from the chemicals and I'm not really going to be able to get in there very well with any of these uh, things. So this is a good point, especially since my arms are tired as fuck, to jump over to doing this with some technology. And that is my Proxon Micromot 
uh, micro moat, however you say it, and some polishing rouge. Now this stuff is called ZAM, and you'll see this in a lot of industrial model making shops. And it's made especially for this, for polishing acrylics, which is Lexan, which is plexiglass. And it's not a lot different than polishing clear polystyrene. Um, this is, uh, you know, similar to what you'll hear people refer to as jeweler's rouges. Uh, but this is made a little bit more for industrial use and ideally to get the job done in a single step. Uh, rather than having to go through a progression of rouges like you you sometimes also have to do. So, um, I spin this thing at uh, around uh, seven to 10,000 RPM, whatever it is. I've got my foot switch down there where I can turn it on. And um, all you do is load it up. And this stuff is nice because it doesn't go flying all over the place nearly as much as a liquid compound does, like Novus or the Tamiya compounds, or even a paste compound like like Shoals or something. Um, on a you know on a motor on a rotary tool, you will end up covered with splatter from 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 that from that stuff. Um, but you could certainly use those and. You could also do this part using liquid compounds by hand, but I'm a firm believer in horsepower, and if I've got it, I'm going to use it. So I'm going to just work this, and then we'll come back and take a look at it. Okay, so there we go. Um, that is not too bad, especially when you consider where it started. That is obviously 
Not perfect. There's a scratch on the inside there, I think, that you can see there that's that I can't really get to easily. That's one of those situations where you got to get clever with with tweezers and things and doing it by hand to uh, to get at something that's down inside like that. But other than me not doing a good job of uh, taking care of that nub that I sliced off and leaving that one spot that you can see there, that seam line is gone, 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 and polished down perfectly smooth. Um, and uh, I think you know that would be a pretty good result. Now, um, two things. Uh, one, you will notice that it still has a slightly cloudy appearance. Um, the, the, I've learned that there's a limit, and this is true with clear plastic or, or clear coats. There's a limit um, to just how, how perfect you're going to get it. What you have to keep in mind is on a clear part like this that it's molded in a, a tool steel injection mold that has been diamond polished to the utmost surface finish by people who do it for a living using all the best tools. Um, and the likelihood that you're gonna return a clear part to that perfect of a condition um, is, is just slim. Because no matter how good you do, you still basically have really, 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 really microscopic scratches in that surface because you know, polishing compounds at the end of the day are abrasives. And, um, you know, it is what it is. But if you come back and buff it with a, with, a, with a dry, soft cloth like I'm doing here to make sure that uh, you've got any residue of the rouge or the polishing compounds or, or whatever removed from it, um, then I think you'll find that uh, you get a, a good result. Um, and if you have gotten to this point, because this happens, you know, where sometimes you will work and work and work and you'll get down to the end and you'll go, man, that looks good. And then you look really, really close and you see that you still have a, a little scratch someplace. Well, no big deal. Just back up to the right sanding grit and fix it and, and go back. I mean, this really, once you do this, you'll realize that it really isn't any magic, isn't anything that's magic. It's just really elbow grease and just work and having the right tools and being disciplined. Um, and, and speaking of that, uh, the second thing I wanted to mention was if you're gonna use a rotary tool like this, one thing you need to always be conscious of is grabbing an edge because that's when the part will go flying off into space or even worse, get snapped in half. And what I mean is that the, uh, this tool, okay, is you can see is rotating uh, clockwise, all right? So the bottom edge is coming up like that. And what you want to avoid when you're polishing like right here is backing so far up that as that lower side of the wheel is coming up, it catches on that edge right there and bonk goes flinging it out of your hand or, or breaks it or whatever. So just always be conscious of where your edges are relative to the rotation of the wheel and adjust the orientation of the workpiece accordingly so that you don't do that. But again, I think, I mean, I'm stoked. This is obviously a very extreme situation, but Hey, I think this came out pretty good. If we can do that good on a piece that was this far gone, you should be able to handle a much more normal situation. Okay, there you go. Uh, that is how to polish a canopy. Uh, hopefully you can see that it really isn't that big of a deal. Uh, it is, like I said, it's just more about elbow grease and discipline than it is about any sort of magical skill set. Um, hopefully I can go off now and edit this thing and it won't be, you know, 300 hours long, but kind of is what it is. I mean, this is just work that takes time and it takes time to film it and, and explain it. So, uh, but at any rate, uh, as always, I hope you guys found this useful 
and uh, that it will make you less terrified of uh, polishing a canopy the next time you need to do it. All right, guys, as always, much love.